good. God is so good. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Is, um, thank you, Lord. Mm. Come on, just raise that up. Lewis, where are you? Come, come here a minute. Stand right here. When I looked your way during worship, the Holy Spirit gave me a word for you. I saw an ice sculpture. An ice sculpture, that's interesting. And, and I saw that you were that ice sculpture. And you had a hammer, and you had a chisel, and you were chiseling parts of your body. And God says, tell him that for a long time he's been trying to build his life, his marriage, his children. He's been trying to build them, but he's been chiseling ice. And every time the heat is on, and every time the temperature rises, everything you've been putting so much effort in begins to deform and to melt. And you get frustrated because you look at yourself and say, that's not what I envisioned. That's not what I saw. And you want to throw the hammer and throw the chisel. But God says, Tell him that in this hour and in these days, I am turning the ice sculpture into stone. And God says, and God says, you, will, you are no longer an ice sculpture. You, will no, you are no longer, you will no longer resemble an ice sculpture. But God says when you look at yourself and when others see you, they will not see one shifting and they will not see one that is deforming and they will not see one that is, that is melting in the heat. But God says, I am making you, son, a stone sculpture. And I, says the Lord, am sculpting you, declares the Spirit of God. And you will this day be another man. You this hour will be another man. God says even your children will not notice you. Will look at you and say this is not the same man. This is not. This is not. They will not know you. This is not the same person. And even your wife will look at you. And say, where has the other man gone to? For I am blessed that God has made you a man steadfast, cemented, stable in all of your ways. And the dream Son, the dream you had, those dreams you pondered on, 
when you would look at yourself and see the ideal you, God says you will begin to see him visib visibly. You'll begin to see him and hear him. You'll begin to see him and hear him. And God says, don't worry about your feelings. They are irrelevant to me, says the Spirit of God. For my purposes are greater than your feelings. Ah, my plans for you are greater than you, than your feelings. Ah, what I am doing in your life is greater than your emotions. Woo. I'm setting you on course, son. Setting you on course. I'm changing the way you see yourself. says the Spirit of the Lord. Come on, give the Lord a clap offering in this house. Woo. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give the Lord a clap offering in this house. God is good. We've been speaking about the power of all. Everybody say the power of all. The power of all. And um, I want you to listen to this very carefully. Because the power of all is not just a sermon series. It's not just a nice faith world theme for the year. But the power of all scripturally must be pursued. And the problem with many churches is that they don't teach on the power of all. They don't teach on the body being one and needing one another, each joint supplying. Are you listening to me? Fitly joined together. This is a scriptural principle. This is a biblical kingdom principle that when we veer away from it, then what we have is really a hodgepodge of believers each going in a different direction. There is no oneness, if you will. There is no, there is no solidarity. There is no unity in any way, shape, or form. And so there, a lot of churches are like that. You attend. You all hear a message. It, it's inspiring. You feel good, you feel goose pimples uh, every so often, then after service, maybe chat with a few people, greet a few people, you're off to your home. There is no sense of unity, there is no unison in the body, there is no purpose, there is no meaning, there is no direction as a body. And that, my friends, is nothing more than a Frankenstein monster. You know, Frankenstein was made up of different pieces, right? Different pieces from different bodies. Different bodies. Hello? Is there an amen in the house? And, uh, and if you notice Frankenstein's movies, especially the old Frankenstein movies, uh, he didn't coordinate his walk really well, right? He's, he doesn't walk normally, you know. Hey, hello, I'm Frankenstein monster, you know. No, he was, you know, walking like this and going like this and so on and so forth. He was awkward, discombobulated, why? Because he was a, a makeup of different body parts from different people, right? And that's what happens to a church when a church is not in unity with one mind and one purpose. The Bible says that we must come together in one mind and in one purpose. This is not speaking hypothetically. This is not speaking even figuratively. This is speaking literally. We must be of one mind and one purpose, and we have to understand. If you belong to a church, you better find out what the purpose of that church is, where it's headed, what is the vision, and am I included in making this happen in the name of Jesus Christ? In other words, what is our purpose? purpose on the earth and if we can tailor it a bit closer what is the purpose of our church in this city somebody say amen, amen. glory to God and so it's important uh, that we pursue 
this. Watch what the Bible says. I'm reading from the Amplified Version of the Bible, and I'm reading from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 11. Everybody say, verse 11. Uh, notice it on your screens there. It says, let him turn away from wickedness and shun it, and let him do right. Let him search for peace, harmony, undisturbedness from fears, agitating passions, and moral conflicts, right? And then it says, and seek it eagerly. Do not merely, listen, this is the command of the Lord. Do not merely desire peaceful relations with God. Do not merely desire peaceful relations with your fellow men and with yourself. But what? But what? Everybody say it. Say it on the count of three. One, two, three. But pursue. Go after them. In other words, God is saying, this is not a matter of whether you want to or not. God is commanding you to pursue what? Relationship with God, numero uno, and then relationship with your fellow man. In other words, God is saying, make sure that you are pursuing oneness or to operate as a body, a complete body. Somebody say the power, the power. of all. And God says go after them, right? Go after it. Go after what? Go after peaceful relationships with God, with your fellow men, and even with yourself. Everybody say with myself. Glory to God. Amen? And he says pursue them. Somebody say pursue them. Now let me ask you a question. We've been talking about the power of all in the church and, and how important the power of all is and how we operate as one body and how important that is for you not just to come to a church and be a, a casual attender, uh, but that you include yourself in the body of the, of the church, that you come uh, and submit yourself, if you will, to uh, growth and to ongoing discipleship so that you can grow in your most holy faith. Jesus left us a model, and his model was this. He didn't just come and sporadically teach everywhere he went, and that's it. And then he hoped that these people would come together and form a church after he had ascended to heaven. That's not God's plan. God did not do this just simply on the hopes that people would get it. He wasn't doing that that way. He made sure that there was a strategic, listen, kingdom plan on building a church and building it from the foundation and so what he did was this he grabbed 12 men he prayed all night the bible says and then he gathered and he went and walked about and began to identify those that would be a part of the foundation of the church so he went to matthew he went to peter and he said follow me uh, he went to the various disciples, Andrew. He went and said, follow me. Are you listening to me? He went to 12 men. He said, follow me. He even went to Judas. And he said, how many of you know God's plans for Judas were greater than Judas's plans for himself? Amen? Watch this. And you see the results. And so he goes to these 12 men and he says, follow me. Why? He says, follow me because I'm going to alter the way you're living right now. I'm going to shift your priorities. I'm going to change those bifocals you're looking at life through. I'm going to cause you to see things differently. I'm going to unite uh, each one of you to each other. I'm going to knit you guys together. Are you listening to me? And so he began to work, and I love this about Jesus. He calls these 12 men. They drop everything, follow him. And throughout the course of the next three years, he begins to listen, eavesdrop, listen on their conversations. He teaches them, and then he waits. 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 What is he waiting for? Their reaction, their response, how they're going to respond to the word taught, right? 
And so here you have Jesus teaching the, the 12 disciples, and then he's walking, and then he hears them arguing. And they're arguing amongst each other. Who's going to be the greater one in the kingdom? Who's going to sit on his left? Who's going to sit on his right? They start arguing. And I love this about Jesus because this is what happens with the power of all. When you are in an environment that believes in the power of all. Listen, when it comes to Jesus and his disciples, it was one for all and... Come on, it was one for all and... All for one. Is there an amen? They were in this thing together, you all. This, this, these were some bad boys. Amen. I could imagine Jesus. Have you ever seen those slow motion movies? When uh, Those movies, and they, they have a part in slow motion where they're all coming out. There's, there's some music in the background, and then they all slow motion. They're just kind of walking. The ones on the side looking to the side and blinking real slowly. Come on, they just look bad walking in together, amen? Can you imagine Jesus walking into a place, a city, a town, amen? All their bo these boys, they must have felt like, <clears throat> come on, man, this is Jesus. We got Jesus. Who do you have? <laughs> Who do you have? No, we have Jesus. We have Jesus. We have Jesus. Whose disciple are you? <laughs> we got Jesus. Did you hear about it? He raised the dead in the last town. Come on, somebody. Amen. So they, they must have been really happy and proud about this. But this wasn't just about being proud to be around Jesus. This was the life that was taking place because they were around Jesus and in this community of 12. The Bible teaches that Jesus would listen to their conversation and then say to them, why? Why are you saying this? Why are you talking like this? Why are you thinking this way? Haven't I told you? And so on and so forth. You start seeing this in the life of Jesus' interaction with his disciples. Why? Listen to me carefully. Because he was chiseling them, molding them, correcting them, rebuking them. What did he tell Peter? What did he tell Peter when Peter said, Master, they're leaving. Your words are hard. Your words are coming across as too much to handle. What, what could we do? Jesus said, what do you want me to do? If you want to leave, you can leave too. Jesus rebuking. Jesus correcting. Are you listening to me? Because that's what happens in community. That's what happens in a church that is operating in the power of all. You don't mind being inspected. In fact, you put yourself out there to be inspected. Is there an amen? Well, who is this person to tell me anything? Blah, blah, and blah, blah, and blah, blah. Okay, who is this person? Who's that person? Let, let, me tell, let me tell you who they are. They are your brother. They are your sister. They are the ones that God divinely put you in. Hear me. The same community they're a part of. And I love this about God. God places us in churches and I'm not talking about people that just go from church to church and they're church hoppers. That's not what I'm, I'm talking about. People that are in a church and this is their church home. God places you in churches and God places you in communities with just enough people to encourage you. Just enough people to lift you up. But just enough people to get on your last nerve. Just enough people to agitate you to get in your face are you listening to me because no one grows healthy in an environment of compliments no one grows spiritually in an environment where everyone is complimenting you and patting you on the back and telling you you look great hallelujah Oh, look at this, brother. Praise the Lord. You look fantastic. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. Yes, because that's how we do in this church. We do great. No. They're going to look at you, and when you come in, hey, man, how you doing? Praise the Lord. What's up with you, man? You look different. Something's up. Something's up. No, I'm doing all right, man. Mm -mm. No, 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 what's going on, man? How you doing? Is it your, your, your marriage? Uh, well, you know, this woman. All right, well, let's talk, man. Listen, I was there, went through the same thing. This is how God brought me out, and I believe God will bring you out. 
what happens in community. It's the power of all. We come together, we draw from one another, we encourage one another, we let each other know, wait, you were, you're there now, but I was there last year, and let me tell you how God pulled me through, and all the hell that I had to go through, so I, I would encourage you to stop what you're doing right now, because you can't, you can't go on this road, you can't go on this way. Is there an amen in the house? That's what happens in the, when we operate in the power of? In the power of? Say it again, in the power of? All. We build each other up. You know how many times I got rebuked by my pastor? Too many to count. Too many to count. I got rebuked. I couldn't stand to get a phone call from him. I was at my job. And my coworker would say, Reverend Alvarez on the phone. I'm like, dun, 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 dun. don't answer it. Werber and Alvarez, line two, I used to be like, man, he called again. I used to say this, if it was important, he'll call again. <laughs> and my phone used to sound like this. And when I used to see... Reverend, uh, Reverend Alvarez on line two. I'm like, oh, okay. Hey, pastor, how you doing? He goes, Danny boy. <laughs> Don't anybody call me Danny boy. Only he called me Danny boy. <laughs> he used to say, oh, hey, D Danny boy. He goes, come by the office. Uh, when do you have lunch? I said, uh, 12 o'clock. He said, come by. I would go by his office. He, would sit, he said, sit down. He said, I had somebody come here and told me this, 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 and this about you. He said, I'm not going to believe it until it comes out of your mouth. I was a grown man. I was a grown man. I, 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 what, what, why is a grown man being held accountable by another man? I didn't know at the time that God was preparing me, molding me, shaping me through not just encouragement, but through chastisement, rebuke, correction, calling you and, and finding out what's true and what's not. And I told my pastor, I said, I said, yeah, that's true. He said, why? When this is what I've taught you, and this is what I've taught you, this is what God's word says, and I'll say, Pastor, I don't have an excuse. All I know is that I need God to show up right now. I don't want to continue this way. Please don't let me continue this way. Sometimes he would weep. Sometimes he would come, sit next to me, leave his desk, come and sit next to me, and pray with me. But one thing I sought to never do was to deny it. If I was caught red-handed, so to speak, I would confess it, say, yeah, Pastor Man, that's what's going on. Or if I knew that that was not true, I would say, no, that's, that's not true, Pastor. But one thing I'll tell you is that I cherish every moment, every rebuke, every correction from this man to me. And to this day, I miss him dearly because he went to be with the Lord two years ago. And I loved, I loved him so much that when I went through a crisis with my wife and we thought it was over, and this was going on now to, to eight years ago, who was the first person I ran to? My pastor lives in, lived in Florida, Orlando, Florida. First person I called was him. And I said, Pastor, I need you. I need your help right now. And this is what's going on, and so on and so forth. And he said, Danny, get on the next flight and come here. I'm going to have a room waiting for you. And I remember I got on a flight, and I ended up over there in Florida. He came to pick me up in the airport. I started weeping in the car. 
didn't know what was going on, didn't know my, my up from down, my left from my right spiritually, or, or even naturally. I just, I just didn't know where I was at. Completely out of it. And when I got to his house, he opened up the doors, went, opened up another door to what would be my bedroom. And he said, here's your things, he says, because I told him I needed to fast and I didn't want to be disturbed. He says, I'm just two bedrooms away. I closed myself in and I started fasting and seeking the face of God, getting up at one in the morning, two in the morning. He would come. He would knock on the door. He would say, do you need anything? I would say, no, pastor, I'm fine. Where are those relationships forged? Where, are those, where was that relationship cemented? Where was it built? It was built in a community of people, leaders that you became vulnerable in front of. That you said, this is who I am. This is how I am. This is the mess going on in my life. We didn't try to look pretty to one another. Because when you're in a community, in a real church, you don't care how they see you. You just want to be seen real. This is who I am. When I'm doing great, I'm doing great. When I'm going through hell, I'm going through hell. But are you there for me? Are you there to encourage me? Are you there to pick me up? Are you there to tell me it's all right? Are you there to tell me you were once there but God brought you through? Are you there? Are you there? Are you there? Or are we just playing games? Are we just showing up to church, looking the part, but there's no life, there's no substance, there's no real confrontation there's no real pick me up when I'm falling come on somebody everybody say the power of all you see God has called us to build he's called us to build a church he gave us a building and this building is about nothing more than legacy. Everybody say legacy. Let me ask you a question. Do you want your children in a church where they are just a number? Do you want your children in a church where they are just counted on Sunday? Do you want your children growing up in a church that knows them while they're growing up, knows their aspirations, are able to guide and to lead, to encourage, are able to connect them to other people in, within the body, to nourish their growth, to nourish them, to disciple them. Is there an amen in the house? See, that's the kind of church God has called us to build. He hasn't called us to build a spiritual social club. He has not called us to build just simply another church in the community. He's called us to build a church that is going to impact generations, that is going to impact and leave a legacy, that is going to know you and know your children, where you're going to listen, be baptized, be married, and possibly be buried. Are you listening to me? Is there an amen? In other words, God has called us to grow together as one. I don't want to be a part of just a social club. There are many social clubs. Are you listening to me? Some of you treat the church like you do Planet Fitness. You go on occasion, work out on occasion. No one knows you other than the one who takes your card or, 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 or checks your number. And maybe an occasional high by with those working out closest to you. But we're treating the church like a planet fitness. Come on. We're not called to be a planet fitness. God says pursue the fellowship with one another. Pursue it. Make sure that you, that you stay connected. Make sure that you know each other. And you have to. Come out of your comfort zone because we don't like to be known too closely. I said that last week. Because we don't like to be measured. 
We don't want to be measured. Because if you're too close to me, you'll measure me. You'll measure me. If we go out, you'll measure me. You're measuring me. Stop measuring me. Okay? Stop measuring me. I like your church, but stop measuring me. Okay? Stop measuring me. But it's better for us to measure one another. Am I right? Because then we know when you're doing well, spiritually speaking. And by the way, you know this through discerning, discernment. Discernment. What's up? Hey. All right. You're doing good? Okay. Amen. Praise the Lord. I, I kind of bear witness in my heart that you're doing great, man. That, that you're doing much better than you were last year. Praise the Lord. Amen? Or, mm, we need to fellowship. We need to talk. What's going on? Talk to me. Man, I'm going through a struggle. I'm, I'm being tempted in this area, that area, and so on and so forth. How many say amen to that? Amen. Somebody say, the power of all. Power. Say it again. And so we're building. What is it, hear me real quickly, what is it that can sabotage the power of all in a church? What is it that can destroy us coming together as one in the church? Okay, what is it? Well, the Bible says in the book of James chapter 3 and verse 16, watch this verse. It's for, it says, for wherever there is jealousy or envy and contention, Rivalry and selfish ambition. There will also be confusion, unrest, disharmony, rebellion, and all sorts of evil and vice practices. So God says, wherever there's no sense of all, wherever, wherever there's no community, wherever there is disharmony, wherever there is selfish ambition, wherever there's that, uh, it says... There's all sorts of evil and vice practices. Is there an amen in the house? Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Come on, I'm not going to keep you long. Listen to this very carefully. What are some of the reasons some churches cannot operate in the power of all? It's because they have allowed to go unchecked jealousies and competition in the church. Jealousies and competition. Is there an amen in the house? Uh, watch what Proverbs says, chapter 22, verse 10. Chapter 22 of Proverbs, verse 10. Uh, th this is another thing that destroys the unity in a church. Scoffing and mocking the vision. Scoffing and mocking the what? The vision. Notice what it says. It says, drive out the scoffer or the mocker. And contention will go out or will cease. Yes, strife and abuse will cease, okay? So God says, what do you do with someone that is a mocker? You know, sits in the congregation. <laughs> Pastor's preaching, he's teaching about one, and so on and so forth, and you're just thinking about the multiple times someone didn't call you. I was in the hospital last week, nobody called me. Power, power of You see, there's no place for that. There's no place for that. Am I saying we're going to be a perfect community? Have I, have I ever said that? No, but we're going to pursue. Remember the scripture? Pursue it. We're going to pursue to operate in the power of all. We're going to pursue fellowship with one another to where we know each other. Is there an amen? amen. We're going to pursue it. It doesn't matter if we are a thousand. If we are 2,000, if we are 5,000, if we are 10,000, if we grow right, listen to me, then we're healthy. We're able to break down, amen, add pastors to care for the flock. Is there an amen in the house? That's why we have connect pastors in this church. We call them connect pastors. And, and these are some people that will come up to you. You don't even know that they're a pastor, but they're trying to help you, guide you, lead you. They don't come with a badge that says, I am pastor so-and-so. <laughs> they don't come like that, but they come in the power of all. And they want to make sure you're connecting to growth track, you're connecting to discipleship, and you don't even know you're talking to someone that's a pastor or maybe a pastor in training. Is there an amen? 
Somebody say amen. Come on. Okay, real quickly. Scoffing. The Bible says, drive out the scoffer. Hey, sometimes we have to drive out the scoffer. Well, the church needs to love everybody. Yes, the church needs to love everybody. But if there's somebody that's causing division among us and refuses to repent after they've been addressed and after they've been approached in with one person and then two people and then the elders, then the Bible gives us instruction and says, drive out the scoffer. And when you do, the problem will cease. Somebody say amen to that. What about gossip and backbiting? Proverbs 26, 20. Look what it says. Proverbs 26, 20. For lack of wood, the fire goes what? Out. And when there, where there is no whisperer, contention, what? Ceases. What's a whisperer? Someone that won't tell you something in your face. They'll whisper it to someone about you. That's a whisperer. They just like to talk to other people about other people. Talk to other people about leaders. Talk to other people about what they feel is wrong, but they never address the people in charge. Somebody say, look at your neighbor and say, don't be a whisperer. <laughs> Amen. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Okay. Now watch this. Real quickly, let's just go to a final scripture here. We're talking about the, the power of all, right? Let's go to Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Let's jump to Acts chapter 2, verse 41. I'm passing over a few scriptures, but that's all right. I want you to notice what the church looked like in the New Testament, what they looked like in the New Testament. And this is so far removed from today's church that it almost looks odd. Verse 41, therefore, those who accepted and welcomed his message were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. This was the preaching of Peter on the day of Pentecost. And then it says, and they steadfastly persevered. Everybody say they persevered. Watch this now. How did they persevere? Everybody say persevering. Say it again, persevering. All right. How many of you know we need to persevere? Persevere means you're in it for the long haul. You're, 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 you're making it through thick and thin. You are fighting through battles. You're, 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 you're remaining standing when all others are falling. Is there an amen? You're persevering. Watch this. And they steadfastly persevered devoting themselves constantly, everybody say constantly, to the instruction and fellowship of the apostles, to the breaking of bread, including the Lord's Supper, and prayers, okay, and what? Prayers. So not only the Lord's Supper, not only are we called as a church to participate together in the Lord's Supper, but we're called to corporately come together and pray. That's what we do on Thursdays on Thursdays, and we encourage you to come out on Thursdays. I spoke to some of our leaders downstairs, and I said, Thursday nights is a non-negotiable. It's a non-negotiable. I, I work in the city, working on building a church, working there with, with con contra contractors and so on and so forth, and I am there early in the morning. I'm there till 4 o'clock. I drive from Chicago all the way to Burr Ridge, 40 minutes, 45 sometimes in traffic. I pick up my wife, some of my kids, and I drive all the way back to Oak Park because I want to pray in the power of all for one hour with the church. That's the power of all. That's believing in the vision. That's, that's coming together. That's saying, I am going to in be included in this. Is there an amen in the house? Watch this. And it says they did the same thing. The New Testament church did the same thing. Then it says in verse 43, watch this. This is what seems odd in today's world. 
and a sense of awe, reverential fear, came upon every soul, and many signs and wonders were performed through the apostles, the special messengers, and all who believed, who adhered and trusted in and relied on Jesus Christ, were united and together they had everything, what? In common, verse 45, and they sold their possessions, both their landed property and their movable goods, and distributed the price among all according as they had need. And day after day and regularly they assembled in the temple with united purpose, united purpose, and in their homes, they broke bread, including the Lord's Supper. They partook of the food with gladness and simplicity and generous hearts. Everybody say generous hearts. Listen to me, faith world. And with this, I close. We have an opportunity right now to set in motion a great wave of increase in our ministry. We have an opportunity right now to set in motion a great wave of increase in our ministry that will be unleashed as we commit ourselves to function in the power of all. If we do not go back to the New Testament model, and all we're doing is reinventing the idea of church, bypassing the biblical blueprint left for us, then we are not going to see fulfilled what God has called this church to do. And so we have to come together as one. That means there's going to be sacrifice. You see, I don't do the things I do because I'm a pastor. I don't do the things I do because I'm a leader. I do the things I do and I act the way I act because I am a son and daughter of Almighty God. Is there an amen? When I say daughter, you know what I mean. We are sons and daughters. Somebody say amen to that. Okay. Now, when... We started our church in, on Fullerton Avenue. I knew that God wanted to save multitudes in that place. I did. It was just a handful of people, 100 of us, roughly, that came together to build out 20,000 20, square foot building, a 20,000 square foot building that used to be a bowling alley. It was 100 of us that became so galvanized in our purpose that God began to do miracles and to do it through us. God began to move miraculously. We started sacrificing. We got a revelation of sacrifice. We literally got a revelation of sacrifice and a revelation of single-minded purpose as a church. God called us together to do this. I had a young man that said, Pastor, I make good money. Uh, I'm a salesman. And he says, the Lord laid in my heart to go this weekend and to go sell all of this product. He had a lot of product to sell. And he says, Pastor, I'm going to go out this weekend and next week and I'm going to bring the proceeds to the church because I believe in what we are called to do. He went out and he did that. I had another woman, and she came to me. She had three children, no husband. She was a single mom. She came and she said, Pastor, I am going to give for the purpose of building this church. I'm going to give every other check. Now, she was able to do that. She said, every other check is going to come, and I'm going to give it and sign it to the church. And she worked at a hospital. And she had a good position in this hospital. And every other week, she came and she gave that check. I talked to you a 
couple of weeks ago about our young people and how they came together and how they went out into the streets and how they worked to help us build a church. People began to sacrifice here and there. God began to do things. First, connect us together as a church. First, the body has to come together. When the body comes together, God sends the blessing. Everybody say he sends the blessing. Oh, how good and how perfect it is. When brethren dwell together in unity, there, God says, I will send the blessing. So when we come together in the power of all, God sees it and he says, now I'm going to bless you. I'm going to first bless you through your own efforts, and then I'm going to touch men outside to begin to bless you. So what did we do? God started doing things, beautiful things. He touched a man from Barrington, driving down Fullerton Avenue, never knew us, never heard of us, didn't know anything about what we were doing. He's driving down Fullerton Avenue, and as he's driving down Fullerton Avenue, he hears the Spirit of the Lord speak to his heart and say, park here, go in that building. When he looks at the building, he says, God, why do you want me to go into a nightclub? Because our church was catering to a lot of young adults, and so I had a whole bunch of neon on the window and so on and so forth. That was back in the day, y'all. Neon was in. Now it's LEDs. And I remember that he said he walked into the building. It was a Saturday night. Walked into the building on a Saturday night. And when he walked in, he said he saw the first floor, and the first floor wasn't finished yet. It was all gutted out. So he walked up the stairs, and when he walked up the stairs, he realized he was in a service. And he sat down all the way in the back of the church. And when he sat there, he waited for the message to, to, to end. And that day, I was collecting the offering after service, as opposed to in the beginning of the service. And I collected the offering that day after service, and that man that came stood up and came all the way to the front of the church, and he gave me an envelope. And when I opened up, I didn't open the envelope. I actually put it, the envelope in my pocket because I thought it was a note. I used to get people to write me notes and tell me, pray for my mom and so on and so forth. So I put it in my pocket. I said, God bless you, man. Thank you so much. Amen. Hugged him. He went. Never saw him before in my life and never saw him again. And that day when we went to count the money in the church, we needed 9400 and some odd dollars to pay for the taxes, the property taxes, because at the time we were not yet tax exempt. And I remember that when we started counting the money, my accountant, if you will, the bookkeeper of the church, she said, Pastor, this is the only thing that came in. And I said, wow. The money was due on Monday. This was a Saturday. And I remembered the envelope I got, I just opened up, took out the envelope, opened it up, and there was a check for 9400 exactly what we needed. I started crying. I started bawling, weeping. My uh, finance person started crying. Her husband comes in. We tell him what's going on. He starts crying. We're all crying in that little tiny counting room that was like maybe five by five that's all I knew it was a bank issued check two months passed the man calls us my secretary says there's someone on the phone he said he's the one that gave the money two months ago I picked up the phone and I said man tell me what happened that day? I need to know. He said, I had just left the closing in downtown. I live in Barrington. I was driving down Fullerton Avenue. He says, I never drive through Fullerton Avenue. He said, but I was just driving down west on Fullerton Avenue. 
And he said, when I got to the building where you all were at, God spoke to me and said, get off and go inside. He told me the whole story. He said, I didn't realize I was in a church until I was upstairs. He says, and when I sat in the back, God says, you see that man with the white shirt that, the white shirt that is preaching right now? He says, I want you to take that check and sign it over to him. And he obeyed. And that day, God moved miraculously. But see, God does not do those things unless first the body assumes responsibility for their part and what they have to do. Is there an amen in the house? Everybody stand to your feet. I want you to look up here for a moment. Next week, we're going to be giving out these little flyers. They're a part of this pamphlet. This, my dear friends, is our Building a Legacy of Faith campaign. We have a building to build. We have a legacy to leave. Is there an amen in the house? And so everyone that is here as a family is going to pray about what they're going to give. Now, after going through all of our tithes and offerings and so on and so forth, we have a basic idea of who can give a certain amount. So we're going to be breaking each family here, listen attentively, we're going to be breaking up each family in our church into units. So one unit is one family. That means the husband, the wife, and the kids. Is there an amen? Not each individual is a unit, but families make up one unit. And we're going to break up the church and families here into units. And we're going to put one unit, can possibly, one unit in our church, or two units in our church, two families, can possibly give a certain amount. 30 units. 30 families in our church can possibly give a certain amount, and so on and so forth. We're not going to call you and tell you you are the unit that can give this amount, but we are going to ask you to pray and to come together in the power of, come on, everybody say it, all, and pray. Some of you have never sacrificed for God like we're asking you to sacrifice now. Some of you have never sacrificed for God like we are asking for you to sacrifice now. This is going to be very clear. Every one of you is going to get one of these. We're going to, it's going to have a letter from me to you. It's going to have our ministry commitments, our prophetic timeline, okay, how this ministry was prophesied and how we've seen the fulfillment of the building we have now when it was prophesied in 1999. And you're going to see all that written here. You're going to see the seven pillars that we build our church on. You're going to see the various ministries that we have in this church functioning on an ongoing basis. You're going to see our faith world timeline here from 1991 to where our ministry was birthed all the way to 2019, where we are now, and so on and so forth. And you're going to be given an opportunity to give. For some of you, it's going to be something radical, out of the box. We know that not everyone is going to give equally. There is no equal gifts, equal amounts. But there is equal sacrifice. We're all going to sacrifice. We're all going to feel it. Did you hear what I just said? We're all going to feel it. Okay? And pastor, well, I, 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 I don't have anything. I don't have anything. Well, then ask God to make a way and give you another avenue of income so that you can bless his house. Is there an amen? Pastor, how dare you? Why would you inconvenience or impose on me like that? Because that's the way that we operate as the Cruz family. When God tells us we need to up our giving, 
we start praying about ways to make more money, whether it's through Airbnb, whether it's through, through uh, coaching for those that are authors. My wife right now is, is teaching people or coaching people how to author their books. These are extra things that we're doing so that we can bless the house of God. Somebody say amen. amen. Glory to God. I bought a car. I bought a car. I invested some money I had, bought a vehicle, and I bought this vehicle at a low price so that I can sell it at a higher price. What for? All of the money is going to the ministry. Did you hear what I just said? Do you see what I'm saying? In other words, don't look at yourself now and say, well, I can't. No, no, no. Say, how can I? Everybody say, how can I? Is there an amen? Now, we're going to be giving this out. Now, you can take a deep breath and let it out slowly. Okay, and the reason why I said that is because this is not due at the end of the month. This is not even due next month. We're going to have one day, and that day is Easter Sunday. And on Easter Sunday, we're going to come because God gave his best. We're going to give our best on Easter Sunday. God gave his son for you, which was heaven's most precious gift. And we're going to, we don't see any better day than to come with our sacrificial gift and give it to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords so that we can build a house for his glory. Somebody say amen. Now watch this. The amount of this particular campaign is $150,000. That's for this particular campaign. But we need a lot more than this in order to build the sanctuary. Everybody say the sanctuary. Okay? I'm not talking about the other side of the building. The other side of the building, as, as you and I are here right now, they're working on the other side of the building. Okay? It's the rest of the building. You know what they're working on? While you all are coming to church every Sunday, they're working on the youth center. They're working on the children's church. They're working on the cafe. They're working on the classrooms. They're working on the theater that we're going to have in the church for the new believers. Come on, somebody. They're working on the conference room. They're working on the offices to do ministry from. They're working on the, on the daycare that we're going to be having there as well. See, they're working on that while we are having services here. But... This campaign is for the sanctuary. For the sanctuary. So what does that mean? That means that this is going to be 150,000. So pastor, how much do we need overall to finish the job? We need 575,000. But hold on before your heart skips a beat. Thank God. He didn't call you alone to do it on your own. Look at somebody and say the power of all. Come on, look at somebody and say the power of all. Look at somebody and say the power of all. Now take your hands, give them a high five and tell them the power of all. Come on, tell them the power of all. Hold on, hold on. Listen to me carefully. Listen, 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 listen. God gave me 100 knucklehead young people. Teenagers that didn't have their head screwed on straight. That I was always having to counsel because they were either getting high or going to the clubs after church. God gave me a hundred of these people. And with a hundred of these people, we raised close to $400,000 when it was all said and done. With a hundred folks, a hundred young people with, with, with uh, uh, minimum, minimum wage jobs. You know what some people would come and do? And they would give as an offering, 
I'm not telling you to do that, but I'm just telling you our experience. They would give, and my accountant or our, our, our church finance person would come after service and say, Pastor, we have $200 in food stamps. What, what do we do with this? And you know what I would say? Put it in a little fund so when anyone comes and they're hungry or they need something, then you take the food stamps and give them the food stamps. See, I know what you all thought. Sell the food stamps. Just give the food stamps. But what I'm trying to say is the people got it. They got it. This, this wasn't just a, a group of religious people getting together uh, all discombobulated and disconnected. No, 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 no. We had become a tightly knit together fellowship of a hundred and so young people that said we're going to make this happen and we're going to build a church because we'll probably never get another opportunity to do it. We're going to give you the opportunity. You're going to pray as a family. For some of you, by the way, we have... How, how can I give? Where can I give from? Well, we have suggestions back here from where God may touch you to give. Is there an amen? And uh, this is a sample. It's going to look a lot nicer, but, um, but it's going to be a blessing. Now, if you tell me, Pastor, can I take it and, and give it to my boss at work and, and we have a fund and all of this kind of stuff, that's okay as a secondary option. It's not bypassing you because then it's not all. Is that all right? You'll never, ever appreciate the building we're going to walk into if you didn't sacrifice. Never. Never, you never, and by the way, very soon when the drywall goes up, we're going to have a Thursday night prayer there, hold on, hold on, and before we start painting, and before carpet starts going in, we're going to go over there, we're going to put prayers, we're going to write down our prayers, we're going to write down our prayers, we're going to write down the names of our children. And we're going to prophesy that their children's children will walk on this carpet, will sit on these chairs, will be in these rooms. Are you listening to me? On the walls. Is there an amen in the house? Somebody say the power of all. Is there an amen in this house? Are you glad what God has called you to do in this season? Is that good? Amen. Close your eyes for a moment, and we're going to dismiss the sheet of paper that we're going to, I'm so sorry, I have you close your eyes, and I want you to see something. The sheet of paper is going to be, this is a sample, this is just a copy on it, but it's going to look like something like this, and it's going to have the different units and how much and so on and so forth. And how many of you know we can, we can exceed 150? Amen. Hold on, hold on. Some of you are going to be getting income tax because income tax season comes. Before you think about squandering it on a vacation, on a third car, squandering at anything else. As a matter of fact, my birthday, my birthday is on April very close to that day that we're going to be doing this, I don't want anyone giving me anything if you have not sacrificed first to give to God. Is there an amen? Don't worry about me. Don't worry about me. I want us to come together as one and give to the King of kings and Lord of lords. Somebody say amen to that. All right, praise the Lord. Well, come on. Father, I thank you for every single person at the sound of my voice. I thank you, dear God, for speaking to us through your word. 
And how your word reveals a community of people that were willing to lay down their lives for one another. Oh God, so different than what we see today in many churches. Where it's, dear God, we don't want to just be a social gathering where there's spiritual messages and encouragement going forth where, where, where there's really no sacrifice and meaning, no direction for the future, no leaving of a legacy.